He heard about the very bleak conditions back in Jerusalem. The Jews had been exiled and things weren't all that nice back in the land that God had promised. And so he heard about these bleak conditions and he pled to God. He pled to the king, but he also pled to God for God to come through. And I want us to look in the first chapter of the book that bears this man's name, Nehemiah chapter one, beginning in verse five. And here in this verse, we find this plea to God from Nehemiah. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you, day, before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Nehemiah cries out for God to hear, for God to listen. The psalmist says this, Psalm 130, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. I want you to notice the theme. There is this governor, soon to be governor, servant of the king, granted, as we find out in the book, that he could go to Jerusalem and help bring security back to that town, to the city of David, the city of Zion. And here the song writer, the psalmist, cries out, and notice the theme that both of them declare. They declare to God, God, would you listen? God, would you hear? God, would you open your ears? Now, you and I find ourselves in the shoes of Nehemiah, in the shoes of the psalmist, because like they, we theologically know that God does not put his fingers in his ears. Theologically, we know that God is always listening. But in the living out of our days, as we see in Nehemiah, as we see in the psalmist, sometimes it appears that God is not listening. And so we cry to God, would you please listen? God, would you listen? God, would you open your ears? God, would you hear my cry? This is the cry of Nehemiah. This is the cry of the psalmist. All of you who are parents have spent time teaching your children good listening skills and good communication skills. Eye contact, no interrupting, etc. And sometimes we feel like we've got to train God to listen. But we understand that sometimes what it is, is truly that God is speaking and we're not the ones that are listening quite so well. Our hearing can be anemic. Our listening skills can be less than they should be. Paul says, and rightly so, faith comes through hearing. But we also understand, in addition to this, this faith, this growing into our relationship with Christ, this, this new birth, that growth comes through hearing. I want to invite you back to our theme verse, John 15, verse 5. And in John 15, verse 5, Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Branches that are attached to the vine bear fruit when they grow, when they mature. And we are in our series talking about what it means to be lively branches, branches full of life, thanks to the fuel of the vine, the food of the vine, and, and our faithfulness to the vine, lively branches. And we find out this morning as we look into the text and other texts that you'll see here in just a few moments, that we need, in order to be a lively branch, among many other things, we need to be listening branches. We need to listen for God, we need to listen for God's voice, and we need to be open to hearing God's voice. One of the highlights of my week is Thursday afternoons. It's one of the highlights of my week. And on Thursday afternoons, I go to either my son Sam's class or to a classroom of a previous teacher that uh, my, both my children and both my sons had. 
And I spend about 20, 30 minutes, depending on the classroom, reading to the children. Uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, Boxcar Children, these kind of things. And they just love these stories, absolutely love these stories. In, in one class, we're in the midst of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, this wonderful book, a part of C.S. Lewis's great tales of Narnia. And before I read in this classroom, the teacher hands me a microphone and I play, place around my neck. And this is so a boy who has a cochlear implant can, can hear me as I read. I'm fascinated by that device. I'm fascinated by the, the progress medically and scientifically we have. So even those people who struggle with hearing can hear. Notice that even those born without hearing, many of them now can hear. And even those who can never hear with their ears learn to communicate and hear through other forms of communication. And the reason they do this, the reason they go through this, this great learning curve of trying to learn language with their hands or, or trying to make sure an implant or something else helps them to hear is because they desire to hear. A desire to hear. There's a longing to hear those who are speaking. I want you to think about that word desire and that word longing. And my question for you today is, do you desire to hear from God? Do you long to hear from God? This is a very important question for us to answer today. Because again, theologically, we know that God is always listening. We know that. We know that. But do we experience that? If we experience that, if we know that God is listening, then our response to his listening is that we need to listen as well. 3,000 years ago, give or take, there was a woman who pled for God to hear, wanted to know that God was listening. And give or take nine months later, she understood that God had heard her prayers. In Samuel chapter 2, we hear these words. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. This was a response of God. Hannah was the woman's name, and she gave birth to the boy named Samuel. And understanding this was God's gift, she, she took baby Samuel when he was done nursing at a time where he could live there in the house of Eli, took him to, to the priest and said, this is God's gift. This boy is going to serve God. And along the journey, as he grew in stature and wisdom, as Samuel grew and later to become the great prophet of God, we first hear the interesting word, the disheartening word, really, that Eli's sons had become so corrupt that they were using the priesthood to, to violate all that God stood against, stood against God's laws. And we understand that Eli did absolutely nothing about it. And so God says that he's going to remove his blessing from Eli, remove his blessing from his family. And it's in the midst of the story that we hear this story, this historical accounting, of the importance of hearing importance of hearing. I want us to look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. As I read that text, I have to wonder I believe it wasn't that God was not speaking. I, I believe it wasn't that God was not showing his glory. I think it was they were not listening. They were not looking. And we see this because of the context. Here is Eli and Eli's sons. Eli's sons who have gone corrupt. Eli who has simply just given up and said, my sons will do what my sons will do. They weren't listening. They weren't watching. And so God says, I'm going to pick one who will. Back to 1 Samuel, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. 
there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. And Eli said, go back to bed, basically. I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. I want to make some observations as we look at those 10 verses. Some five observations that we can find in this text that show us the importance of hearing and show us what it means to hear God and to respond to God and to know God's voice. The first thing that we see is that he, Eli knew not who spoke. Eli knew not who spoke. I want you to think about that with me for a minute. Here is the priest of God, and this is in the day where people needed a priest in order to talk to God. Eli did not know when God was speaking. Eli did not know until the third time that it was God who was speaking. And notice the location. Not only is it in the house of God, but next to the ark of God. So if you're going to hear from God, wouldn't you think that in the house of God next to the ark of God would be a pretty good place to hear from God? If God is speaking in the presence of the ark in the house of God, would you not at least think, well, maybe that's God speaking? But Eli's first response is, and I read into this perhaps, but he's just bleary-eyed, says, I go back to bed. Go back to bed. Eli knew not it was God who spoke. We also see that the Lord called Samuel. The Lord called Samuel, not Eli. I want you to hear this. Again, the Lord called Samuel, not Eli, because Eli, the blessing was going to remove from him. And so I have to wonder, when is it? And we look through all scripture and see this, and we see it in our day, that God will often speak to the most unlikely, at least from our perspective. God will often speak to those and we say, how could God choose that person? How could God choose her to be the, her, his messenger? How could God use him to be his messenger? How would God speak? And again, I think God is speaking all of the time. But are we listening? Third, we see this. We see that Samuel responded, but not to the right voice. Why is that? Well, it's because Eli was his teacher. Remember that since he was around three years old, he'd been raised in the house of God by Eli, and Samuel had trusted his teacher. And it's not until after where I've read, we find out later, Samuel is told, after he listens to God later in this chapter, that, that God is going to remove his blessing from Eli. And so at this point, Samuel does not know that yet. So Samuel still trusts Eli, and Samuel will take Eli's word as God's word. And imagine Samuel's shock when God goes around Eli and goes straight to him. Hey, God, what about my teacher? What, what about the one who you're supposed to hear from you? Why me? And I have to ask you, are you in the spot where you say, well, maybe I'm hearing from God, but you just don't trust that God would speak to you? God is speaking to you, perhaps, and you're not hearing because you expect him to speak to someone else. We see another truth in here, and that was that Eli had not trained Samuel how to listen. 
Notice this verse. I find it quite intriguing. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. In the house of God, next to the ark, tutored by the great priest Eli. And the word of God had not yet been revealed to him. Certainly that is commenting on the fact that God himself had not called Samuel yet in the way that he would. But again, I think there's some lack of teaching there, some lack of instruction. I know, I know as a child, thanks to my grandparents and my parents and great men and women of the church and my pastor, volunteers, they looked upon me and, and others there in the group and spent time teaching the Word of God. Spent time saying this is what the Bible says. Spent time saying this is how God operates as best as we understand it. Here is God's word. And I wonder, did Eli just skip that whole duty? Did Eli just look upon Samuel and say, I know Hannah gave me him. And I I know that he is someone that God will use. But I'm just not going to teach him. It, it, it saddens me when parents will, will talk to me and I'll ask them about their children or their teenagers later as they get a little older and they, they somewhat pridefully say, well, I'm just going to let them make up their own mind. I, I, don't, I don't want to teach them something because they'll just grow up and choose their own faith. And I think how sad that is. Yes, they will grow up and choose their own faith. Yes, they will grow and decide where they are with their God. But how neglectful it is when a parent does not sit down with his or her child and say, this is the word of God. This is what I believe. This is the scripture. You can't make the decisions for them, but you can pour into them so that they have the truth. And this final truth I see, this fifth truth, is that God was waiting for Samuel to listen. And I love this. Because he says Samuel, and then Samuel, and then Samuel, and then later Samuel, Samuel. But it wasn't like God just blasted Samuel. He didn't say Samuel and just launch into a speech, a divine speech. He knew Samuel wasn't quite ready. And so he waited on him. Listen to these verses, verses 9 and 10. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Lively branches listen. And I can think of no better summary of that action of faith than the words of Samuel. Samuel. Eli at least got this part right. Eli at least went to Samuel and said, oh, three times. I get this. God kind of works in threes a lot. And so maybe this is God speaking. And so Samuel, here's what I want you to do. Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want to point out three words in that sentence that are crucial to understanding how to be a listening, lively branch. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Lord, serving, listening. Servant, Lord, servant, listening. Speak, Lord. Notice there is that word that says, you are greater, I am less. He must be exalted. I am here. And so he not only calls God his Lord, but he also calls himself his servant. Before God has spoken, before God has spoken and told Samuel what he's going to say, he's already said, I will serve you. Notice this. Speak, Lord, for your servant. We'll get to the next word in a minute. Speak, Lord, for your servant. Do you know anybody you trust so much that you're going to say yes before they ask the question? I love those kind of relationships. 
Well, you know you can trust them. You, you, know, you know there are people that are going to say, go jump off a cliff, so you don't want to say yes before that. But there are people that you can trust. And ultimately, you can trust God. And I love this. Before he even knows what God's going to say, he doesn't say, speak, Lord, and I might do what you say. Speak, Lord, and I'll think about it. Speak, Lord, and I might be your servant. He says, speak, Lord, your servant. Do you want to hear from God? Put yourself in a place of hearing. You're asking God for direction. Should I take this job? Should I make this decision? What, what do you want out of me? Don't go into that question thinking, well, I may take option B if he gives me option A. Go to God and say, God, Lord, speak for your servant. Your servant. In other words, no matter what you say, God, your will, not mine. We talked about your will be done, not mine. Servant. And then listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I'm ready to serve. I understand your authority. And so now I'm going to listen. And notice what Eli said early in verse 9. He says, go and lie down, and if he calls you. So Eli said, maybe. Maybe God's going to speak again. We're not sure. So he says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Tony Carledge wrote about this time, this conversation. He says, Samuel is the story of every one of us who in our own bumbling and stumbling way have said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This is our story. Every one of our stories in our own, as he says, bumbling and stumbling way. And so I want to ask you, what is your way of listening? It may include a lot of bumbling and stumbling, but that's okay. How do you listen? We are in for a real treat. Because what I, I want us to do is to hear from our own people. How do I hear from God? And so I've asked a, a few of our folks to, to share their journey, to share some of their story of what it means to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want you to watch this video and hear from men and women in our church who know what it is to be like Samuel and say, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Twenty years ago, I think I was like a lot of people, and it was, you know, going to God when I needed something, or I would, we needed something, either, you know, finances, or I was stressed, or something, I would just go to Him. Now it's, you know, as, as the journey has progressed, to me, it's a, a daily conversation. I would be like my best friend if I didn't have, you know, if I wasn't able to talk to my best friend on a regular basis, that friendship would, would kind of die out and it wouldn't stay strong. I think prayer is an essential part of being able to become more like Christ, to know more of what God wants for you and to advance his kingdom. And it's that essential nature of it that makes it such a core feature for the believer. And for me, it's communicating with the Lord and hearing Him give me direction and listening to what He says and then trying my best to do it. There's times for like the more formal prayers, but for the most part, it's just it's talking. It's talking to a friend. It's being honest. It's um, being open. It, reading the Psalms and reading David's prayers, you get a feel for that because David didn't follow the script and he didn't. He wasn't careful in what he said, and he was as honest as you can be, and God answered that. You get to talk to God one-on-one, -on -one, the maker of the universe. It's a really cool concept, if you think about it. I mean, it's you and the ultimate being talking to each other. This is a brilliant question, because this is most of the important for me, like, like a Christian. Uh, first of all, for me, this is uh, fellowship with God. 
just fellowship, first of all. And of course, we, when we are praying, we are talking about our needs, we are talking about our feelings, we are talking about our mind. But first of all, for me, this is a fellowship, closest fellowship with God. I've learned to wait. And in the waiting, in the quiet, I'll know, I can hear if I'll have a peace about it. Um, yes, God is always in control of our circumstances, but we live in a sinful world, and sometimes we like to put ourselves in the God's seat if we're praying for things that are against His will or when we're praying out of our own compassion and we're not seeing His will in the situation. I, it's not that it's an unanswered prayer, because He answers our prayers. You see, when I start thinking of that, you know, just I'm in that rut where I feel I'm asking for the same thing over and over again, that's when I start to listen. That's when I open up my Bible and I read a little bit. That's when I feel I need to have that talk with God. I mean, you can ask for something all you want. There's nothing wrong with asking. There will never be anything wrong with asking. As long as you know that you're going to get an answer either way. And you may not like that answer, but that's, that's how it works. I'm so thankful that he doesn't ever give up on us. No matter how much we mess up, how stupid, what the stupid questions are that we ask him. And, and the Holy, I mean, to me, the Holy Spirit they left with us, I mean, that's, that's kind of like the plug, you know, that's plugging into the power source, you know, and, and you know, we don't know, I, I have a friend that thinks that, you know, she doesn't hear from God, it's like, okay, you're not going to get that Charlton Heston booming voice, you know, like in Exodus, it, it's going to be still small voice. It's going to come through other friends, even people that aren't Christians, God can use. And it's going to come through His Word. That's where you're going to hear those answers. Of course, when I have some questions or some needs or just want to say thank you, doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how for me. I just want to be in touch with God. Yeah. Last summer, our oldest son had an infection in his shoulder and was put in the hospital for a week and nobody, I mean nobody, the experts, nobody could figure out what it was. And he was on IVs, they tried different antibiotics, we prayed intensely for him. They finally found an antibiotic that worked, but we, I, and we believe that it was prayer that spared his life because it could have taken him. And I don't think God gave him to us to then take him away before he was through with him. And it was um, very intense. I, um, I want to fall back on an experience that I had many years ago. And I'm thinking about that because I can look out that window and I can see mountains. Um, some 40 odd years ago, Linnell was in a mental hospital. Shock therapy treatments, I'd go see her, she was heavily medicated. We had a son about two and a half and another one about six months old. And the psychiatrist said to me, your wife will never be well. You will never have a normal life. You won't have a wife, your boys won't have a mother. It's pretty much hopeless. And all we can do as doctors is give her medication, which keeps her in a range between wanting to do violence and basically not being awake. And we will just continually adjust her meds so that she falls within that range. And we had a lot, of, I mean, there's a lot more to this story, but we had a lot of people praying for us and so forth. Um, but I was at the point, in my head, I trusted God, but in my gut, 
I felt hopeless. And we were members of a, a Baptist church in Colorado Springs, and at that time I was a law professor at the Air Force Academy, trying to have a, a you know a, a Air Force career. And the auditorium of that church was arranged so that if you looked out, you sit on the back pew and you look out, you could see Pikes Peak. And for those who've never been in Colorado Springs, Pikes Peak dominates the skyline. And I was thinking about here, it would be as if these Chukash Mountains behind us were three times as high as they are. It just dominates the city. And so I'm sitting there on the back pew and the choir director got up and said, this morning we're gonna sing an anthem. And I don't usually do this, but this anthem is taken from Job 38 and 39. And he read it. And I looked out the window and God said to me, if I can make that mountain, just that mountain, I am big enough to deal with your issues and your problems. And for the first time, I had hope. <laughs> and the end of the story is, he believed that. I quit taking my meds, and little by little by little, I began to regain who I was. And I started reading the Bible. And I would read the New Testament three or four times a year, and the Old Testament once or twice a year. And I did that for over 10 years. And I got my mind back. God gave it to me. Wonderful stories from right here in our own home, in our own place of worship, the people of Rabbit Creek. And if we had time, every one of us who has ears to hear would have a story. And as you've heard their story, I want you to think of your story. Lively branches, listen. And so I have a challenge for you this morning. Very simple. Go and listen. Go and listen. God, we give you glory.